evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Turn Left. I am your host, Indiana's own Dana Black, coming to you live. Yes, all the way live from Black Pearl Studios, where we talk about Indiana politics from the left side of things. Listen, y'all, I'm trying to tell y'all, if you want some real entertainment, if you want to get your jollies off, if you are a political junkie like me, you need to be tuning in on a daily basis to the General Assembly. Now, I know we feel like we have the best and the brightest being elected into our state house, but I want you to understand that ain't necessarily so. There's some interesting folks running around that state house crafting legislation. And because there's a supermajority of Republicans, some of the stuff that should never be seeing the light of day is getting out of committee and getting through chambers. And it's a hot mess. I've never seen people who claim to want individual rights and the ability to control their own bodies and get government out of my business. But every 15 minutes, they in somebody else's business. They too busy trying to control what parents do, but won't have, they want to have parental rights. I'm going to need them to make it make sense. It doesn't make any sense, but that state house is a hot mess. But if you don't pay attention to what's happening and if you don't get involved in civic engagement, then policies will happen to you versus you happening to policies. So let's talk about what's going on in the state house. I, I, I can't even wait. Now, uh, the AP reports HP HB 1334. Indiana voters would have to submit more identification information to obtain a mail-in election ballot under a bill Republicans are advancing through the state legislature. The Indiana House voted 64 to 27 along party lines Wednesday in favor of a bill that would require voters submitting a paper application for a mail ballot to include a photocopy of a government-issued identification card or at least Two ID numbers, such as their 10 digit driver's license number or at least the four digits of their Social Security number. The bill sponsor, Republican Representative Tim Wesco, said the step was aimed at re- increasing voter confidence in elections by putting identification requirements for mail in ballots in line with those for in person voting. Democrats, on the other hand, they argued, but just ain't enough of them to keep the argument up, that the additional requirements may disenfranchise some people, especially older voters, who find it difficult to navigate the additional requirements. Voter rights uh, groups maintain that the ID requirements aren't necessary because the, the county election workers already must confirm that a person's signature on the application matches that from their voter registration card. I mean, this is just one. More. See what happens. Voter turnout goes up. Republicans come up with new ways to prevent people from getting from casting their votes. That's all it is. They don't want you to vote. I don't even know how many more times they can tell you they don't want everybody to vote. I don't know how. Yes. OK, fine. Voter ID is here, but you don't offer a free identification card. So you got to pay for that. Now you're asking people who, you know, are essentially baby boomers and older where maybe technology passed them by. We don't know. Hopefully they have the ability to photocopy their ID. If not, they, somebody's got to drive them or get them to a CVS or a Walgreens or a Kinko's or whatever and have them photocopy their ID. I don't understand why we got to do all of these, why we got to jump through all these hoops to, ca- hoops to cast a vote. But this is what's happening when we don't show up in May. They pass these kind of bills. I, old people, I'm sorry. I don't mean no disrespect by calling you old, but you made it to be old because it's better than the alternative. Your right to vote is sus. That's all I'm saying. And of course, the state house is attacking my community at on full 
blast. There are so many anti-LGBTQ plus bills in the state house right now. It is ridiculous. I'm wondering why my tax dollars are going to fund such frivolous and nonsensical pieces of legislation. It's driving me insane. Let the ACLU, if you guys are not familiar, the ACLU of Indiana, you can go down, go to their website and they can list all the bills that they are watching. And, and it just so happens all the bills they're watching. I'm watching. So SB 480, this bill prohibits families and doctors from providing age appropriate evidence based care for youth who require it. the status of this bill. It is passed out of committee. I watched the testimonies of this bills of these bills. And I was literally in tears listening to parents beg these legislators to let them have parental control over the medical decisions for their minor children. I don't understand why they don't get to have control over those decisions, but it passed out of committee. It's on its way to the full Senate floor. HB 1608 would effectively ban discussions or acknowledgement of LGBTQ plus people in schools under the guise of banning uh, conversations around human sexuality. This language is incredibly vague and would shield discussions around sexual orientation and gender identity in grades K through three. Now, what they don't talk about is that when these folks were at the state house testifying against this bill, there were people who were there trying to ban the book, uh, The Hate You Give, which is a book about a p- the police shooting an unarmed black person. And the story re- revolves around trying to keep hate out of the hearts of young black people for, and, and keeping them from going to kill police officers. But they want to ban that book. They want to ban that book. So it's not even about human sexuality. It's about the ability to, if I don't like a book, then nobody should be able to read it. Y'all understand what this is? This is book banning. Now, this is really, really important, y'all, because once we allow these folks to determine what material should be in libraries and most of the people don't even read the books that they're trying to ban. They can't even most of these books. They don't know what they even read. They want to ban books by Toni Morrison because there may be a reference to a a, a rape. The the book is not about rape. It's not about teaching people how to rape. It just tells the story of what could happen. I'm just saying. All right, SB 12 and HB 1130. These bills prevent elementary and secondary schools and non-college university libraries from raising a defense to existing law, which makes it a felony to expose minors to harmful materials. These bills also strip away protections for material that is disseminated for educational purposes. It's passed out of committee. These two bills have passed out of committee. I don't know what they have against gay people. I don't know what they have against LGBTQ plus folk like myself. Yes, me. I'm a proud African-American cross-dressing lesbian. I don't understand what they have against us. They get my tax money every month. I pay my, my property tax twice a year. I pay my uh, uh, excise tax when I get my license plates. I contribute to this society. But every time we turn around, they want to silence us, marginalize us and pretend like we don't exist. But you know what? They done messed around and messed with my people. And I got the biggest mouth in the business. So I'm going to keep on talking about it. I'm going to keep on bringing awareness and I'm going to keep on recruiting people to be on this rainbow team I got. All right, but there's some good bills that are coming out. So let's talk about those, because if we don't talk about the positives, y'all think Indiana ain't nothing but a bunch of negatives. And it's not true. There's some good stuff that does come out of that state house. All right. 1648 HB 1648. This bill would create a system of medical and geriatric reprieve to support safe evidence based pathways to uh, to release for the elderly and those with terminally costly life hampering and or life threatening medical conditions. It would also incentivize the pursuit of work, education, vocational achievement and treatment by people on parole. Lastly, it would increase government transparency and efficacy around offender progress reports by providing people who are incarcerated with a chance to identify errors before release and by ensuring relevant supervising agencies have access to reports allowing individuals to build on progress made behind bars. This has passed out of the house. 
This is a positive piece of legislation. Um, it offers people a second chance. It gives an opportunity to be reacclimated into the world. All right. Another really, really great. And I'm actually excited about this piece of legislation because I remember when I ran for office way back in 2016, I sat down with the young Latinos who were working on, you know, uh, making sure that they had they could get in-state tuition. And one of the things they were talking about were um, driver's license or some way to legally drive to get to back and forth to work and back and forth to school. SB 248 provides that an individual who is an Indiana resident and cannot provide proof of identity or lawful status in the United States may apply for a driving privilege card to obtain driving Driving privileges sets forth that requirements to obtain a driver's license. See, this is good because now with this, they can also go get insurance. So if they accidentally make a mistake and they have an accident, they can be insured. This is a good piece of legislation. So as much as I rail on the lunacy that's going on in the state house, there are some decent pieces of legislation that are coming out. And you guys need to keep your eyes on these things. Go to IGA.IN.gov. You can type in the bill number. You can read it. You can find out what's going on. You can also watch live testimony. You can watch committee hearings. You can watch the House and Senate floors. I'm telling you, the committee hearings are where it's at. Because the, the, be, the best thing I saw all week, and I'm just going to tell you a little snippet, and I'm going to keep going. Senator Eddie Melton introduced a piece of legislation that would address the shortage of medical facilities in Northwest Indiana by maybe offering some uh, financial appropriations to kind of bolster up there. And Senator Liz Brown, and I mentioned her before, to all my bakers and cookie makers and candy bakers, I'm going to need y'all to make her a big batch of cookies so y'all can sweeten up her disposition because she about the meanest little person I have ever seen in my life. She don't have no love. But Eddie Melton, Senator Eddie Melton did a wonderful thing. I don't know how he did it. He was able to hold it all in and address it like a professional because I'd have told the chick to be quiet. I'm not. That's why I don't know if I'm electable material. <laughs> I'm going to keep working on it. But in the meantime, to all my candidates who are on the ballot this year and you are looking for a way to get your message out guys scan the qr code black pearl it solutions and black pearl studios i have everything you need for your event to live stream your event i just live streamed the allen county young democrats event last night their black history month event um i have the ability to be an mc a public speaker but i also can do um a, pr a c content production so that you can have a 30 second spot my rate are reasonable. I'm telling you, I ain't trying to break the bank. Act Blue pays my salary, pays my mortgage. I'm here to help you get elected. And I have the tools that you need to create the digital content that you must have in these modern elections. So hit me up, scan the barcode. I am your girl. All right. That was some fun rants. Now let's get to my guests. Because see, I, I love young people. I, in my mind, I'm still a young Democrat. I'm always be a young Democrat. I was with the Allen County Young Democrats and I keep telling them, y'all not finna age me out. I need that young juice. So tonight I got two young folks but who are seasoned veterans. They've been in this work, knocking doors, doing the, the behind the scenes dirty work. First up, one of my longest political friends, and I, and I mean that, a friend. He has been a friend to me. I met him in high school. And I believe one day he is going to be our, our governor of the state of Indiana. Y'all give it up for my guy, Nick Roberts, who's running for Indianapolis City County Council in District 4. Nick, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on, Dana. Um, I much appreciate it. I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying, as we were talking about before, this is my third turn left appearance. <laughs> I think what up there in terms of guests. So I, I appreciate it a lot. I always appreciate the platform to help you do it for the party. I'm so thankful for being here. I love it. And next, someone, if, if y'all don't know who this cat is, first of all, you're missing out on one of the smartest fellas in the city. I don't mean just in Pike Township. Yeah, I know where he lived. I'm not just saying in Pike Township. In the entire over 850,000 
populace of Indianapolis. He is one of the smartest. I worked with him down at the city county building. We've been behind the scenes and IDAC for years. Y'all give it up. And I'm, I was so excited when I saw that he put his name on the ballot. He's showing up. Y'all give it up for Maurice Scott, who was running for Indianapolis city county council district six. Maurice, welcome to the show. You rookie. <laughs> You're on mute, bro. Thank you so much for having me on uh, your show. Uh, I watch it uh, all the time. And so, you know, it's like, is it my turn? Is it my turn? And so finally, you know, it's my turn and I'm happy to be here and uh, happy to speak to, you know, all your guests. So hello, everybody. That's what's up. And I've already got a whole lot of people chi people chiming in. So tonight what we were going to do, if anybody wants to ask any questions, I am going to read the chat and I will, if they have any questions for you, we will. Um, also, guys, you know, I try to turn these into many fundraisers. Um, if you like anything that either Nick or Maurice have to say and you want to support their campaign, they need dollars. Their Act Blue links are right there. Yes, I said it. Their Act Blue links are right there. Please consider donating to their campaigns and of course any guests appearing on turn left is not an endorsement by indiana's own dana black i'm just trying to get some love that's what's up all right so i'm gonna start with maurice since he's oh one more thing this is the anniversary show <laughs> welcome to the anniversary show all right we're gonna start with maurice maurice tell the people who you are and where you come from oh my name is maurice scott i am from brunswick georgia uh, and so Brunswick was on the map a couple years ago, and I think actually today is Ahmaud Aubrey Day uh, back in Georgia, but that's my hometown. Um, and so I, I moved up to Indiana uh, to go to law school, and I stayed. I liked it. I loved it. Uh, there's a lot to do. Mm -hmm. And so my wife and I, we got married, and we have four kids. Woo! And so, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> But, you know, I'm an attorney, uh, adjunct professor. I also coach Little League Sports in Pike Township. You know, uh, even though I'm an attorney and an adjunct professor, I just think I'm a, I'm your next door neighbor. Uh, and that's kind of what my campaign is about. You know, it's called Neighbors for Maurice. And, you know, I don't let, you know, any of the titles um, dictate who I am or anything like that. I'm just a regular, ordinary brother. That's I am. It's a regular black guy. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm just honest, you know, uh, you know, I have friends who are doctors and lawyers and judges. I also have friends who, you know, may have done some things, but you know, we're all at the end of the day, just regular ordinary people. And that's just the way that I see myself. I love uh, it. But, but I got to yeah. ask what made yes. you want to go to law school? Cause I tell you what, ain't no way, ain't no way I'm going. What made you decide to, to buckle it down and go to law school? Uh, well, I mean, it wasn't my initial uh, decision. I wanted to be uh, an educator. I wanted to, to be in higher ed. I wanted to be like Tavis Smiley and, <laughs> uh, you know, Dr. Cornell West. I wanted to be on panels and speak eloquently and, uh, you know, talk about the state, uh, the affairs of, of black people. Uh, but I had a professor who was in school my last semester, Mr. Willie Edwards. He said, Maurice, he, he said, you are very thoughtful. Uh, you know how to write. And he said, you're different. And he said, this is something that you need to do, something you need to look into. And so I looked into it, you know, and so um, I applied and I, I got into law school. Um, and it's probably the best decision that I ever made. And I'm thankful, Mr. Edwards, he, he died, you know, over, over COVID, during COVID. Mm. Uh, but it was the best decision I ever made because, you know, a lot of decisions are made by attorneys. So whether yeah. it's education uh, you know, things that's going on in the state house, locally. I mean, you can you can be an activist, but at the end of the day, a lawyer hand is touching whatever you're going through. I mean, even if it's something small as, you know, I've I've reviewed um, field trip forms, contracts, you know, just to make sure that everything involves a lawyer. Uh, and so for that reason, you know, when everything was broken down, it's like that's something I, I'll be interested in. And you also help people. I mean, yeah. that's what you're doing at the end of the day. You're solving problems and you're helping people. I love it. I love it. All right, Nick, again, tell the people who you are and where you come from. Yeah, well, I, you know, well, you're Indiana zone. <laughs> I consider myself Lawrence Township zone. <laughs> I love it. I, I tell people I'm born, raised, living in Lawrence Township. 
spent my entire life in this area. Um, fourth generation resident. Our grandparents moved up, great grandparents moved up to the area um, in you know the 60s and 70s, and have been here ever since. Um, you know, I'm so appreciative for it. Um, you know, that, that's my kind of my family background. I have a twin as well, which is always gets people when I tell them I have a twin. Um, in terms of my political background, you know, I, I think a lot of my life story has happened through politics. You know, like you mentioned, I've known you since high school, and I've kind of come of age through, um, you know, being involved and in trying to make a difference. Um, after the 2016 election, I was so upset with what was going on, like many people. And I just, you know, I was sitting in the living room with my grandma downstairs and, you know, she's like, why not turn your anger into activism? And I did. And I started uh, applying to a few internships, Marion County Democrats. I accepted that one. She got really involved from there, started working on campaigns, making a difference. And not only the campaign side, but I, I really appreciated the community side as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a lot of enjoyment, especially when it's an area that's familiar to you. It's one thing to work on stuff in other areas, but you know, that's one of the reasons I just love, you know, again, working in my areas because all my family's here, you know, I've lived my whole life here. So when I, you know, drive on a road that gets cleaned up by some, you know, cleanup, right? I see the effects of it the next day. It's not some abstract mm -hmm. thought that happens somewhere else, right? So that's big for me. Um, I went to Lawrence North. My mom went to Lawrence North. My grandma was in the first graduating class of Lawrence North. Still an IEPY right now, too. Uh, professionally, I work at the trustee's office in Lawrence Township as the director of community relations. And I also have uh, a small business on the side, a data analytics LLC that I use to help out campaigns whenever I can and other entities that might need it. So I do a lot of data visualization stuff. So I wear a lot of hats. I'm also the president of the Lawrence Township Democratic Club, too. So I do a lot of stuff there. Um, and really, again, the community is where my heart is. And um, it's where um, I've really had a lot of, um, you know, appreciation for it. Um, I'm running for city council, as you mentioned, District 4, in Northeast Indianapolis. Um, I'm only contested in the Democratic primary. So um, that's fantastic so far. And I mean, I'm going to have, a, I'm gonna have a, a competitive fight for November. So that's where my focus is right now and building support for that. Um, and it's going just phenomenal so far. The, 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 the support, not just from the Democrats, I know, but even the moderates and Republicans have been overwhelming and we've had such a great response so far. So working hard at it right now, going to continue the hard work. And again, I appreciate the platform for having me on to help, you know, explain my message and why I'm running. I love it. So I have my first question from my chat. Um, it's Kathy uh, Jimka, and I hope I said that correctly. She's from Terre Haute. She uh, wants to know what was the main focus that made you guys run for political office? And she said it's a question for both of you. And uh, Maurice, we'll let you go first. Uh, so the main focus that made me want to run for the office, I always wanted to get into politics. I mean, I think that was something that, you know, when you're young, you have student council and student government and things like that. And uh, those are things that I've never done. I did not do. Uh, you know, because I think a lot of times you're like, am I good enough? Will the people like me? Yep. And so I'm the type of person who like, I, I just watch, I watch, I look and I see, okay, what's going on? You know, what's good, what's bad. You know, if I was in this position, you know, what would I do? And so I think over the years, I've just done that. I got close to a lot of, you know, politicians, uh, you know, and I consider a lot of them uh, friends. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the more and more I got involved, it's kind of like, OK, I can do this, um, mm -hmm. you know, and being from a small town, moving to, you know, Indianapolis, which is, you know, a large city, <laughs> uh, you know, you're kind of like, I really can do this, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, you know, meeting people. I think if if a seat ever became open, I would run for it. And so when the when the maps were redrawn and the seat became open, you know, I said, hey, I'm going to run for seat. City County Council. Uh, and, you know, there are things that, you know, goes on in the city uh, that I think that need to be improved on. And so, you know, different candidates have the different platforms. And, you know, my platform, I think, was unique because I, I there are a lot of people who talk about uh, some of the issues. But I, I think when it comes to actually solving those issues, uh, they, it, you know, it wasn't going out to the forefront. And so, uh, and when it, <clears throat> so that's why I say I'm going to run and this is going to be my platform. I love it. I love it. Nick. 
Yeah. And honestly, I, I echo a lot of that, but I think for me, it's in general, I would say a lot of it. I, I know I mentioned the word community a lot, but for me, it's just making a difference. It's cliche as that sounds, you know, and I think when everyone gets into politics, they often just drift the national politics first because that's the flashy thing. That's where a lot of the excitement is. That's where people think you can do the most. But I really am a firm believer in Dana. We've talked about this. The local politics is where you can make the difference. Yep. And yep. You know, I don't even think it's local politics as much as just local kind of community. You know, being local politics is as much about going to the you know different boards and organizations in your neighborhood a lot more than it is about going to these political events, right? And I think it's just about being active, involved, engaged in your community. And, you know, really that's where the difference can be made. You know, when I get calls about different issues going on, those are things that can actually happen. You know, we can focus yep. on moving funding towards, you know, better road quality. We can move our funding towards having a really vibrant, you know, downtown. We can do all these things that are attainable and we can see the results in them, right? Again, like I said, you can go through the city and find all these different projects that the council's worked on. And my three big issues really are infrastructure. Wait, I didn't ask that yet. Hold on. We going to get there. <laughs> well, so that's hold, what the, hold, on. hold on. Okay? Hold on. Hold on. You, you don't get to do the segue. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah. We going I promise you. We going to get a chance to dive into that. I want to make sure that like yeah, yeah, cuz I want to I want to put it where it belongs, right? So I gotcha, have, a, okay. I, and I loved, I loved Kathy's question because it actually was a good segue to the next question that I have for you guys. What what I find interesting uh, from both of you is that you know, Maurice, you are a transplant. You grew up in a small town. Now you live here in Indianapolis. Nick, you grew up right here in Lawrence, in Indianapolis. You've been here um, both times. You guys are both vying to be on the city county council in the city that you live in. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge you a little bit, Nick. Talk about what advantages you think there would be for Maurice being a transplant. And Maurice, you talk about what what uh, advantages you think it would be for Nick being someone who's been here the whole time. The reason why I want to do it that way is because we need be, we need to have people who understand all types of situations. And that's where you two are like kind of opposite of each other. And that will give you all, you know, give people an opportunity to hear how you can relate to each other, even though. You have different experiences. Nick, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, that's a really great question. I think the first um, example is the fact that being from a different city, you have a different perspective on things, right? You know, my experience is completely shaped through, you know, like in terms of policy, you know, if there is a, this might be a dumb example, but, you know, if, if I-69 is shut down, right? <laughs> that completely shapes my perspective of all of government, right? Whereas if you're from a different area, whether it's a different part of the city, different state, right? You have more of, a, I would say, a broad experience. I think everybody looks at local government through their own perspective and their own neighborhood's perspective. And I think it's important to look at it big picture sometimes because ultimately there's going to be winners and losers to every policy. And I think having, again, kind of a, a full approach to looking at these issues is important. And I think being from... Um, a, a rural area too. I think you have a different perspective on the advantages of a big city. I take a lot of it for granted. I take for granted the fact that, I mean, in many ways, my district is pretty suburban. I mean, I, there's no bus line within 10 minutes of where I live, right? So I don't have a lot of the advantages of Indigo and these things that, you know, often define a big city. But I, I think you have more appreciation for the things that are there as they are. But also, you know, I think you still have kind of that um, humble background that, uh, that gives you, again, a different perspective to come at it from. Okay, I like that answer. Maurice? Uh, I mean, I think Nick has been talking about it all night when he says community. Uh, so he he has that, you know, family relationship. He has that friend relationship. Uh, you know, being from someone who's not from here, uh, what I see is a lot of people are connected through their high schools. And so you have people who say, hey, you want to L.N.? I got you. I'm going yeah. to support you because you went to LN. Oh, you went to Short Ridge? What year? You know, and so that's how Indianapolis works. It's kind of like, you know. North Central, too. Yeah, it depends on, you know, whatever high school you went to, you have that relationship no matter what year you graduated. And so, uh, you know, having that local connection is very important because, you know, even if it's someone who Nick doesn't know, you know, his mother may know, his twins may know, his grandmother may know. 
uh, and you know, have, even having the connection of working at the trustee's office, having you know that connection as well. I mean, his network will be much more broader uh, than mine or someone who's not from uh, Indianapolis. And so, uh, you know, I tell people all the time. I say, you know, uh, my last year of law school. One of the, I went back home during a break, and one of the judges, you know, he said, I'm going to retire in a couple of years. You come here, you practice for three years, and this is yours. Uh, and so, you know, obviously I didn't take him up on that offer. <laughs> and we're but, happy you did. You know, but that opportunity is available because, you know, people want their own to succeed, yep. especially when they're seeing you uh, trying to, to do something. And so uh, it's easy for I think someone local to be supported as opposed to someone from outside. Like, wait, who is it? Who are you? Where are you come from? I mean, and but you know, the good thing is, you know, I can have people who are from here or who have been here for a while who can vouch for the work that I've done. Yep, yep. And I, I like both of y'all's answers. And yes, big ups to the Panthers, baby. North Central High School, no. class of 1988, baby. Yes, 1988. Uh, Indiana's on Dana Black, turn left. We are talking today to Nick Roberts, who's running for City County Council, District 4, and Marie Scott, who is running for Indianapolis City County Council, District 6. Make sure you guys uh, find them and support them. All right, let's get into the meat and potatoes of it all. Nick. There are a lot of things that are happening in the city. You know, I know a lot of people feel like either the mayor should be resolving all these issues or the prosecutor needs to fix all of this stuff. I have never known any situation that could be handled by one person or one entity. The city county council, they decide where the money goes. Real talk. So talk about your main issues um, and why you are running for city county council yeah absolutely and also first of all i'll just give a quick aside um it really laughed made me laugh when marie said the thing about the high school thing because i've seen you data multiple times that's how i mentioned the north central thing because i've seen you multiple times with miles nelson amber denny the north central pride is real and my dad's a north central uh alum too so i can understand that um but yeah, so policy-wise, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, it takes a village. One person cannot fix everything. And I think that's especially true when you look at public safety, infrastructure. These are issues that touch, you know, the entire city, right? Even if the council is doing literally everything perfectly, had, you know, 100 times the funds we did to solve these problems, there would still be problems that pop up, right? Mm -hmm. So it takes us to know that we have a limited budget and best locate the funds where we can. Um, like I said, my three main issues, uh, infrastructure, particularly roads and uh, roads and sidewalks, public safety, supporting our law enforcement officers and building partnerships between them and the community, and third, mental health. I think mental health is an incredibly important mm -hmm. issue that affects pretty much all the other issues too. And I would say fourth on that too, it's, it's an issue that I really have a passion for too, is I, I would say being strategic with my district includes, you can see on that behind me, really two ma main kind of uh, districts, I would say with Geist and then Castleton. And both are unique in their own ways. Castleton, I would say, is much more of a revitalization plan, trying to get it up and running. There's a lot of very strong neighborhood focused community groups putting a lot of the work to revitalize uh, Castleton. And a lot of my focus is gonna be supporting those groups, being a part of it, getting involved with the business community, getting buy-in from them, making the mall a really great place to be. And then with Geist, all, kind of similar to that too. Actually, this might surprise people, but Geist has less of that organizational structure. Mm, I'm not. Um, getting that up and running with the business community and others is important, getting the feedback from them. My family, we've owned a lot of small businesses in the area. We've owned a couple in the Castleton area. Um, so I would say that small businesses, there's an important part of my cornerstone because they're the people that see the effects of all of these policies directly. So supporting them in all the initiatives they have is important. And the overwhelming response I've gotten has been on the two issues, set specifically public safety and infrastructure. And those are the ones that my priority is going to be as counselor and just making sure that we fully support those two programs. I, d I do want to ask a question about one of your points, and that's mental health. Um, yeah. talk, um, you know, a lot of us are in my generation, we're still coming to grips with, you know, the acceptance and, and being open and honest about um, the help that folks need when it comes to taking care of their mental health, just like they need to take care of their knees and elbows. Right. 
But what are some of your ideas in addressing um, the mental health concerns in the city of Indianapolis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll start by saying that um, it's an it's an issue that's affected me like pretty much everybody in Indianapolis. Everybody in Indianapolis knows somebody that has dealt with mental health on a real level. Um, my story's been a difficult one with it, not myself personally, but family members. Um, I actually lost my grandmother to suicide when I was a kid. Um, oh, wow. She was the one I, I mentioned that was a Lawrence, first Lawrence North grad, and our parents had my twin and I were in high school. So we were raised primarily by our grandparents. Um, so it was really tough on our childhoods. And on the other side of the family, my dad is a disabled army veteran. And through him, you know, obviously there's issues that pop up because of that. And he's lost eight men in his company from to suicide. So it's a massive, massive problem. Um, and really, you know, it's something that I was never really compartmentalized well before recently. Um, and it's something that I think a lot of families carry shame because of. And you know, as much as it's a policy thing, for me, it's as much about being open and being vocal about the issue it is and being just transparent. You know, I think it really, the issue of mental health touches on every other issue. It affects crime, it affects education, it affects um, drugs, it affects veterans, it affects all these different things, right? And if we can just make an impact on it, I, I think that is a phenomenal issue to, to really take champion of, to be a champion of. Um, so it, again, it's an issue that's affected me a lot, my family, um, and I just really want to be a vocal person for it. And yeah, there's some level of sigma sigma still there, but I honestly, I found the the, the response I've gotten on that issue too to be overwhelmingly positive, and people really see it as a need. Um, and even though I don't necessarily think it's all because of the pandemic, obviously it's been underlying sure. for a while. I think it really showed how much it is because so many people are isolated now, so it's tough. But either way. I appreciate the question, and it's an issue I'm really passionate about. Yeah, but about. but how but how in your role would you try to to help people that are struggling um, with with mental health issues? How would you use yeah. your role to do that? Yeah, so I mean, I think a big part of it is the public safety component. I think the fact that we ask police officers okay. to handle mental health crisis is totally unfair to everybody. It's unfair to the people dealing with the crisis and the, the police officers themselves. They're already overworked. You know, the last thing we want to do is put them in charge of people that are having these episodes due to their mm -hmm. mental health, drugs, alcohol, right? And then we throw all these people into prison when they don't need necessarily to be in. I mean, they need to be something, but often rehab is what's the better solution than, um, you know, you know, if they're an alcoholic, again, uh, prison is not the best rehab for alcohol. The best. Mm -hmm. Oh. Rehab is rehab, right? Right. And it's it, it creates these cycles, obviously, of coming back and forth. So first and foremost, that we need we need 24-7, always on call, supported mental health people that can solve these problems when they pop up. I think that's the biggest way. Um, also supporting mental health and our work, you know, city county employees, I think should be able to take mental health days and we should support those sort of programs. Um so there's a lot of different ways that it can affect things and also just being vocal about it, talking to people about it and being open, I think, makes a difference and it creates a lot of the um a lot of the sentiment i think that's important long term to really move the ball on that issue and keep it going long term i like i like that i like that you want to handle you don't want i think people misunderstood the slogan and maybe it was poor marketing about defunding the police um maybe they should have called it reappropriating the police funding <laughs> you know what i'm saying like because we don't want to send police officers into situations where and in many cases don't let it be a big black dude having a mental episode because that big black pianist who is multi talented talented will be dead. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I tell a real story? My bad. <laughs> that, that's a great answer. Maurice, uh, what are your main issues and why you're running for office? Uh, so my main issue is housing. Mm. Uh, I think we have a big housing issue and crisis uh, in Indianapolis, and it goes twofold. Uh, so one, we have a municipal agency who is putting liens on people's property for, uh, you know, s you know, small things so that you may have your, your gutters may need to be uh, fixed or you may need to cut your grass. Uh, you may have some other sort of violation, but, you know, they're putting twenty five hundred dollar uh, liens on people's property. And if you don't repair it, then they'll put another violation. And so uh, if you don't pay that, that goes where that goes to your taxes. And if your taxes, you're only paying, you know, five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars a year, and you got an additional, you know, five thousand dollars on your taxes, what happens if you don't pay it? It goes to tax sale, and then what happens? You lose your home. 
Uh, and so a lot of people have lost their homes that way. And what that has caused is gentrification. So a lot of people who lived in Riverside, a lot of people who live in Hallville, a lot of people who live, you know, by the Julia Carson Center has lost their homes. And so that's how you have some homes that are worth 80,000 next to homes that are worth 400,000. And so what has that caused? That has caused their property taxes uh, to go up, which, you know, if you don't pay your property taxes, what happens? Your house goes where? Yeah. Back, to, yeah. back, to, <laughs> back to tax sale. Uh, and a lot of people who are buying these homes are, you know, they're not local people. They're people from out of the state. And so a lot of people locally are not even being able to, uh, you know, buy the homes here. Uh, secondly, there are not a lot of affordable housing. Uh, and I think that's kind of going on throughout the country. I mm -hmm. think we need to figure out a way uh, <clears throat> to make affordable ho housing. Uh, I mean, the city owns property. Uh, and I think, you know, one way to deal with that is to uh, work with small developers, work with some of these big corporations uh, that we have here and invest in housing. The house doesn't have to be worth three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars. We have a working class who are, who are able to afford, you know, the eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars a month, um, you know, for a home. I mean, you have people who are paying. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars to live in an apartment, mm -hmm. and a lot of these apartments, uh, you know, I know because I I do the work, are slumlords. You know, they always have they have issues with mold, they have issues with mildew. Uh, there's plumbing issues. There's a, a infestation of rodents, and they say, hey, I'm not paying my rent. What happens when they don't pay their rent? They they go to court, and you know, the judge asks, hey. Are you, you know, are you behind on your rent? Yes. Uh, you know, they don't ask why, you know, mm. because that's for the second hearing. So you can have mold, mildew, and some of the judges say, hey, well, my hands are tied. Uh, and so we need to figure out a way uh, to handle that situation so that, you know, one, people aren't stuck going from apartment to apartment, uh, paying these exorbitant fees, especially for these slumlords, and so that there is a real housing solution where they they can have their own home that's not three hundred four hundred thousand but just a, a starter home yeah. uh, and that's all that um, you know people want you know they want to be able to live in a place comfortably they want to live in a place that's safe and I think that uh, that's something that uh, the city can can do uh, because if you don't have a place to stay or if uh, you know you're being evicted and you need a couple hundred dollars. Some people would do what they deem what they have to do in order to do it. And so I think in order for some other issues, you know, crime and stuff uh, to decrease, decrease, you know, we don't want to, as they say, the chickens come home to roost. Right. And so we're going to have to solve these issues before this stuff comes knocking at our door. Uh, yep. So that's my, that's my main thing. Uh, number two, um, <clears throat> you know, it, both of them go hand in hand. I think we, we kind of touched on it a little bit is, you know, I, I think we need to uh, give more money to nonprofits. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and that comes, you know, <clears throat> and I think that that's what the council did uh, this year. But there are a lot of nonprofits who are not doing the work. Uh, they just know they have a great grant writer and they know how to write grants. Mm -hmm. And I know because. I look over their paperwork and I see how much these people are paying themselves mm. uh, and the amount of work that they're actually doing for our kids. And a lot of people are not doing the work for our kids. and They're lining up our pockets and they're using other nonprofits to do the work and writing them into their grants. But they're not even the money that they're supposed to give the other nonprofits to do the work. They're not doing it. So I think we need to have a process where the people are actually doing the work. I mean, we have people who are multiple groups and organizations who are sending kids to Africa. We have most organizations who are sending kids on college trips. We have organizations who are taking kids out of their environment so that they can see something different. And a lot of people are self-funding their work or they have to beg and ask their family. They have to mm -hmm. ask and beg their friends. They're working on GoFundMe and they can actually show results of right. the work that they've done. And, you know, these are the organizations that we need to, uh, you know, fund because they they can show the results. They may not have the sexy name recognition. They may not have the right people 
on their board, but they are doing the work. Uh, and, so, uh, yeah, and, and, and so they need transportation, uh, you know, so between hours of three and seven, when kids are coming out of school, we know where the kids are, as opposed to a lot of kids who are getting in trouble are not bad kids. Sometimes they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, or they do something small and it escalates. Yep. But if they're in a safe environment, um, in a place that can take them home, that way we can, you know, we can track them. Their parents know where they are. And so they can come home, eat, uh, wash, go to bed. I love and, it. Uh, and, and that's, you know, those are two of the main things. And specifically for District 6, I mean, I think for years I've watched Northwest Way Park kind of, you know, go down. I mean, it's, they don't have good lighting in the back. Um, the equipment is old. They don't use the swimming pool. Uh, the basketball goals, I mean, they look like something from the 80s. Um, and I think, you know, this park could be one of the best parks in the city. It was and, for a long time. Yeah, I mean, it, and, and I mean, that's the way it should be. And so if, if you're not going to use the, you know, swimming pool, at least the, the building where the swimming pool is, I would want to use it as an entrepreneur hub for people who, who uh, live in Pike Township. And so that way they can have their meetings or whatever their business, you know, a coffee shop, you know, something. Uh, so it's, it's being used and people can, you know, keep their money, you know, in Pike Township. Uh, and so, yeah, so those are, are the main ideas that I, I have to be uh, the counselor. I tell you what, you you got me over here thinking about a whole bunch of things. I want to go back and make this a general conversation. Uh, you talked about affordable housing and you, you actually you talked about corruption a, a couple of different ways, which I really appreciate because, you know, people don't realize, you know, there is so much funding available. But because you don't have a great grant writer, people who ain't doing nothing. Are, are getting all the funds. I'm. St I know people are still trying to figure out what the ten point coalition did with all their money. Oh, did I say that out loud? My bad. Anyway, uh, <laughs> corruption. But but I want to ask you. You you said you talked about affordable housing, and it just made me think. You know, inflation. Yes, obviously, always has an impact on the cost of things. But the uh, with people. After the pandemic, people coming out of the pandemic, they were no longer saying, I'm going to take keep these crap jobs for these crap salaries. I'm going to go find something else. And as soon as people started walking away from places, housing prices went through the roof. I, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but. Doesn't it seem kind of odd, y'all? And we could just, I mean, just you planted the seed, Maurice, so you have to deal with watering the flower. Uh, <laughs> doesn't it seem odd that as people were becoming more mobile and making different choices about jobs, the housing, the cost of housing went through the roof. So it kind of forces you to stay where you are versus being more free to look for something else. Just a thought. I mean, Personally, I mean, me, I mean, I wouldn't go that far, but <laughs> from what I, what, I mean, from what I see is the every ordinary day person isn't buying homes anymore. Homes are being bought by corporations, right? You know, if you, I'm not going to say any, any names, but, you know, a lot of these, you know, people who own these housing, housing, a lot of them own, they don't own a whole subdivision, but they own a lot of homes that are in the subdivision. Mm -hmm. And so guess what? They can dictate the price. And so if you own, you know, uh, if it's 50 homes in a subdivision and you own 10, you know, you can, you can put yours up, you know, a couple, you know, a couple hundred up higher. And then guess what the next person going to do? They're going to, well, if they're charging this much, I can charge this much because, you know, my home looks better than theirs or, you know, make it com comparable. You're like, I'm missing out on money. And so when you have, companies and you know corporations getting into uh that market i mean that's what you're going to see i mean it's not about housing anymore it's about profit it's about business yep. and you know it, it, but you know those business decisions are affecting you know every ordinary day people and so people are basically in a rat race going from you know one place to the next i mean i think the days of staying in you know one place for a significant amount of time is over because yeah. you know people are looking for 
what they can afford. Uh, and now, you know, it's kind of competitive. And, and like I said, I mean, you have places that people know are filled with uh, mold, mildew, uh, rodents, and they charge the same as a nice place because they know, they know they buy. I know when I get my letters and the phone calls for my little place, I tell them I'm at 3.5 million. <laughs> you want it that bad? You you yeah. gonna pay cash? Give me 3.5. That's, that, that's the same thing. I put I put two million cash. Uh, two, I so mean, it's that's not, out of our range. <laughs> non-negotiable. You know what I'm saying? Right. You 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 call me, ask me for my property. My property ain't on the market. Therefore, I can. Sell it for what I want. I, 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 you know, Nick. I know I may have been way out there in my thought process, but I'm always trying to connect the dots. What are your thoughts on affordable housing, especially as a young person who, you know, you're still. I know you're still an undergrad and working your way through. Um, and you, I know you're going to be thinking about these things. How, how does the affordable housing situation impact you in the th in the way you think? Yeah, it's a massive, massive issue. It's one I hear about from young voters constantly. Um, you know, I really do think there's also something to be said about supply demand. You know, I'm an economics guy, and we're just not built enough housing. And I think there's opportunity there, and it doesn't have to necessarily be in Indianapolis, but um, I think downtown is the hub of where these things should be happening. Um, and it's been it's been a massive challenge. You know, there's always the the you know all these other factors at play, right? There's gentrification. There's um, the way that it affects you know other things, right? That we have to be strategic with it and think about it, but um, you know, ultimately, people's housing is such a you know it's such a massive priority. And I think if we had more of a supply, there'd be not be as many people living on the streets. You know, as you have more houses, the price goes down. Absolutely, um, I think th that's one of the reasons we've had such a massive spike in homelessness since COVID. Really, is because under the basically year and a half and still happening with supply chain issues, right? We're not building enough housing that there's not enough supply, you know, and, and there's, and there's problems with, you know, landlords that take these houses and then they, you know, jack up the rent and it makes it, it makes it a problem, but ultimately they would have to move the prices down if we had more of it. And, you know, absolutely not of homelessness we have in our city is unacceptable. We have to find a ways of working on that. And I think, um, there's, there's solutions we could find that are specific to them that are not just, you know, abstract, um, more housing policies, but um, I'm a firm believer that in order to you know have a great downtown, I and mean, we've seen it, you know, the whole the old model that our city worked upon of downtown was um, we're gonna have everybody work downtown. Businesses will be open from eight o'clock until five o'clock, or, or not five o'clock, but you know eight to eight, right? So people that commute can get lunch, whatever they can do, whatever they want. Conventions come downtown, sporting events come downtown. But that whole model doesn't work as well. Now we don't work from home. Work from home is happening. The tourism isn't happening as much downtown because the conventions are a lot of them moving virtual. That we have to find ways of being creative. And I think the number one way to support business downtown is having more people living downtown because that's how we make things happen strategically. Um, and you know, if we look at again this problem, um, I, I I really just do think that we have to re relook at how we've. Uh, made our downtown. I think housing is a big part of that, just because we, we can't rely on the Eli Lilly workers to, to you know, Cummins, staff our, NCAA, yeah. NCAA. But there's a lot of, but see, there's a lot of businesses in Indianapolis. There's, don't let them fool you. I mean, talk about the hospitals right, yeah. alone. Right. I mean, uh, in Indianapolis, we're very, very fortunate in, in, in Marion County of all the opportunities to find. I remember being a young person, you know, in my early, you know, late, early, late teens, early 20s, knowing that I could get a job at any warehouse before I went to school. Right. I could get a job at any warehouse because I could drive a forklift and I would never be without a job. You know, right. those high paying jobs are there, too, between Cummings, NCAA, Eli Lilly's, you know, don't there's plenty. There's plenty of six-figure dollar workers, and that's oh, oh, I'm gonna get to that. There's a lot of six-figure dollar people who work in Indianapolis, and then they commute back to the donut counties. I'm not saying I got, I'm not hating on where nobody lives. Please trust, don't believe that. Take your little money, go on back across the party line. I don't care. However, I do have an issue with them using our services, using our roads, and they are yeah. not contributing. And then I hear the complaints about um, um, uh, Indianapolis roads. Now, we, you know, our roads are kind of sus. So we know this. But talk to, I mean, is there is there any way 
that we could ask these folks who commute into Indianapolis to make those six figure salaries to, uh, to contribute to the infrastructure that they use every day. Yeah, I mean, that's that's you hit the nail on the head, not just that, but also the fact that the state road formula. And this is what I think about often, according to the Indiana, uh, again, infrastructure plan, a, a, a road in back rural Indiana that might have, you know, a couple hundred people drive on it a day. gets the same amount of funding, regardless of, you know, the, the amount of lanes, anything right as, you know, 82nd Street, right, which has tens of thousands of people driving on it today and many of them are from out of county like you mentioned and they're not paying for those roads so you know it's tough right now in terms of the funding for those two main reasons out of county commuters and the road formula um and i think that's really why we're having a lot of these fights and we have to work at the state house you know it, that's why you can't just work in the city county building in isolation or the state house in isolation we have to work together to make these things happen, and we have to build allies in the state house to really work on this. Because Indianapolis, like we all know, is always gets the brunt of pretty much everything. everything out of the state house, and it's intentional. They want to make it look like we're incompetent, we can't manage ourselves. But when you look at all the ways that things are funded, all the different services that are given, Indianapolis is not ever. Um, <laughs> we're not. True. We're not having problems. We're not having problems. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. It, you know, despite that, we have the six, a sixth of our state's population. Again, we get about half the road funding we should. And, and that's not even including the out of state commuter problem. So um, I'm not sure what the solution for that, the out of or out of county commuter problem would be exactly, but we have to find ways of solving it because that's really where a lot of the discrepancy comes from in terms of the funding we should be getting. Absolutely. Maurice, you want to talk about that at all? Uh, I mean, I think Nick hit the uh, nail with the hammer when he talked about the, the formula that's being used, I mean, with Indianapolis being the one, the capital, and two, you know, the most populous, uh, you know, we're not receiving the <laughs> amount of funds that we should be uh, receiving. And, you know, that fight starts at the state house where, which you stated in the beginning, has a supermajority. And so they can kind of do what they want to do, when they want to do it. I mean, they may say, hey, this is a bad idea. This is a terrible idea. And then two years later, hey, look what we're doing. Yeah. And, you know, make it make it something, you know, try yeah. to make it their own. Yeah. Uh, and they've done that, um, you know, just so they can get the glory and praise. And so, I mean, I, you know, there's going to be have to be a time where that decision to change the formula is going to have to be made because people are going to, you know, stop coming to the city. Right. Uh, you know, all these conventions. Are going to say, hey, you're going to have to do something about this, or we're not coming, and that affects not just Indianapolis, but it affects the entire state. The entire uh, state. And so, you know, <laughs> I, I think some people don't look at it that way uh, because they're on their own little bubble yeah. and they get to go back to their home. Um, but you know, it it makes the entire state bad, missing out on different things. Oh my God, this is, listen, we are so close to the end, but I have so many more questions I want to ask. I'm, I'm going to run a little long. I have one more question. Um, I bought my first house. Uh, it, my first purchase was in Pike Township. And the last house I lived in was in Lawrence. I now live in a condo. I, I, yeah, I, I know, I know, uh, I have a good, and I grew up in Washington Township. Okay. So I have a good handle on the north side of Indianapolis. And I also recognize that the north side of Indianapolis um, by far is the more affluent part of our city. There's pockets of everything everywhere. I understand that. But when you guys, you guys both are representing um, essentially parts of the city that um, are in, in, in better shape than other parts of the city. Um, how will you be able to uh, manage the needs of your your township and the area that you're running and the needs of communities that have less and maybe need more, how will you be able to navigate um, those types of discussions? Maurice, I'm going to start with you. I mean, I, I don't want to say I think that's easy, but I mean, I, I think I have an advantage because I am of the community, right? So just because I live in Pike Township and Saddlebrook and we have a, a golf course in our neighborhood doesn't mean I can't identify with, 
you know, certain groups of people, people who, because guess what? I, I come from there. I just, I told everyone, you know, I come from a small town in Georgia. And so we didn't have a lot of the resources that are available in Indianapolis. And so, you know, just talking to people, speaking to people, seeing what they uh, need and not just making decisions Mm -hmm. based on what you think they need, because Mm -hmm. what you think they need is not necessarily what they want. And so, you know, just being able to talk to people and listen to people, I think is very, very imperative of anybody who wants to do this type of work. I mean, you can't get into politics. You can't be a person, a servant leader, if you're not listening. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're not amongst the people and not just amongst the people when, you know, you want to be elected or when you got something that's going on, you have to be immersed with the people and immersed in the culture. And, you know, like I said, you know, I have friends who are, you know, in both worlds, you know, and so I can, you know, you know, go to a function with, you know, the more affluent and I can go to a backyard barbecue and have a few drinks too, uh, right, because right. that's I, I've that's who I am. Um, just so you know, I don't see myself as you know this affluent person. I mean, even though some people may, you know, see me as as a certain way because I'm an attorney. I mean, when I tell people, they're oh my God, you know, get yeah. hugs and thank yeah. you, thank you, brother. You know, I, we don't see you. Uh, you know, people like you, and we we love you. And, you know, just, you know, getting that love and admiration um, and they see me the same place that they are and they recognize that I am, I want to help. And this isn't anything to feed, feed my ego or something. But Maurice, where, you know, I, I got to break in real quick. Don't you want people to not be surprised that we're educated? I mean, God, I, I, I'm so I get so frustrated as a black person, as a woman. Like I, it bugs me that people are like, oh, you're in I.T.? Uh, yeah, anybody can be an IT, you know, or, oh, you have an MBA. Yeah, anybody can get an MBA. You, you, I, I, and just, OK, I'm, that was a sidebar. I'm sorry. It just frustrates me. I, I, I know what you're saying. Like, I get what you're saying. But like, don't be surprised that we're educated. Don't be surprised mm-hmm. uh, and to us. And that's, you know, this is the last mm-hmm. show in Black History Month. Black people, don't be surprised that other black people are educated. Stop it. Okay, Nick, (laughs) Nick, talk about how growing up in Lawrence, you can see the rest of the city. Yeah, and I think Lawrence Township is a, you know, my district, again, Casson and Geist, which is overall, you know, the most probably, not maybe not Casson as much, but the Geist Geist area. area, Yes. Especially the wealthiest area of the the county or the township, especially even the county, maybe. But, you know, when I went to Lawrence North, I, you know, I went to the Geist Elementary School, right? But then I went to Lawrence North and I had all these people of different walks of life, right? And that's really the beauty of a diverse area is we get all the perspective. Yeah. I think one problem, though, and this is one thing I think anyone can attest to, is when you're on the council, when you're in the state legislature, when you're in these levels of government, the people you get feedback from, the people that go vote, the people that make the donations, the people that do the things that make the, you know, make the sausage, right, that, that keep the machine going, are not the people that these policies affect the most, you know. It's the people that... Um, you know, have the, the resources to make it happen. And that's the million dollar question of government is how do you balance those two things? When I talk about, you know, or when I hear about the issues in Castleton, when I hear about these different problems, the people I hear the feedback from is not the people living in the apartments around the mall yeah. that are directly affected by these in every way. You know, yeah. if there's a shooting in Castleton, that might affect their, you know, rent. That might affect a lot of these the different things, yeah. right? Affect their housing values. But people I hear about it from the people living Geist who are t- detached from it. Yeah. But they keep up, you know, they keep up a lot more in terms of the the ramifications of these things, right? So we have to find ways of balancing that. We have to get feedback from everybody. And I think one way I'm doing that as a candidate is I will not ignore anybody. You know, when when people often knock doors as local candidates, turnout was so low in the apartments. I think people also neglect it. Say, oh, screw it, I'll just ignore the apartments. Focus all my efforts in the housing additions. But for me, strategically, you have to get input from everybody. And whether they're Democrats, Republicans, you know, renters, owners, anything, right? Young, old, you have to get that, that's the point, right? You represent the people in that district, whether they vote for you or not, whether they vote at all or not, right? And when we serve in government, it should not necessarily be about the people that vote for us or the people that have the donations, right? It should be about doing the things that 
you know, make a positive impact on the most people in the city. And often the people that those policies affect are the most voiceless people. So it's something I reflect on of how to balance that. Because ultimately, like I mentioned, those people are not the ones that leave comments on my social media posts. They're not yeah. the ones. It's like I'm young. I'm, I'm, I'm as young as any candidate is, but I still don't get feedback from the young voters yeah. as much as I should be. Yeah, and you're not right. You know, two points you made there. I, I remember knocking on doors um, up in the Geist area, and I, I almost looked dumbfounded at these folks when I, you know, ask them, you know, how can I help? How would I be able to serve you? And they wanted to talk about what was going on in IPS. You don't know nothing was going on in IPS. What are you talking about? But, you know, you have to be quiet and listen because they're so worried about little black boys. No, you're not. Stop it. And then the other thing you talked about was apartments. You know, everybody talks about how they want, you know, their Indiana's version of Stacey Abrams. One of the things that they did, one of the programs that they did in Georgia to turn Georgia blue was they had a program that was specifically targeting apartments. And that particular program was very different than targeting homes and sub, uh, subdivisions because people in subdivisions aren't as transient as the pe people in ap apartments. And so their plan, they had a different plan for door knocking and engaging. We unfortunately don't have enough people that want to do the work um, like y'all did, like, you know, Nick, you did. I've, I've watched you work on multiple campaigns. Maurice, I've watched you work on multiple campaigns. People don't want to do the work. Unfortunately, but they just want to complain about it when they get bad policies. All right, Indy had his old Dana Black. Uh, we ran over, but this conversation went by so fast because time flies when you are having fun. Uh, Nick, tell the people where they can find you. Yeah, so I'm Nick Roberts317 on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You can look at Nick Roberts, find me. Got my Act Blue too, got it linked everywhere. Act Blue is amazing so far. We've raised so much money through it. You can find it everywhere, really. We've had a grassroots oriented campaign. We've had 600, 700 people donate. It's been donations of 10, 25, 50 bucks. Small and that's, you know, those add, up, those add up over time, you know, we're, you know, we're, we may not always have the most money, but we have the most support and the most donors. And I think it goes a long way to show the support we built up. So you can find me everywhere. I'm so appreciative for everybody that listened. Thank you all. All right. And do you have any events coming up? Uh, not, I had a fundraiser last week. I probably won't until after the primary, but, um, I'll, I'll, I'll have a continuous, uh, amount of events through the election. I'm already going 24 seven on campaign stuff. So knocking doors starting soon. Um, if you want to help out, please let me know. All right. Make sure you share your info so I can share it with the listeners. Maurice, tell the people where they can find you. All right. You know, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, um, neighbors for Maurice. Also have a website www.neighbors the number four maurice uh <clears throat> so look me up we're uh on, looking up stuff daily we're posting daily uh we're actually out in the community um my act blue is always active you know click on the link or whatever dana has so you can donate <laughs> to my uh campaign i mean that is the most important part of you know a campaign you know you don't have to get, have 500 250 you know ten dollars would do it uh, i love it so yeah and do you have any events coming up uh i just had a fundraiser last week uh i also uh, i'm having a fundraiser in gary indiana on april 22nd oh. so if, it, if there's anybody out there um who's from gary who has family and friends uh in gary uh look out we'll be in uh you know gi uh in two months uh, to, you know, raise funds and, you know, speak to the people in, in Gary. I love that. I love that. I love bringing Gary down to Indianapolis and taking Indianapolis up to Gary. That is a, a part of our state that has been incredibly neglected and we have got to do better. Um, that's a beautiful part of our state. I don't know why. We don't, I know why, but I ain't going to say it here. I mean, it's, it's the last, this is the last show of Black History Month. We're going to talk about it. If there's a concentration of too many black and brown people, you know, white flight is real. I'm not trying to hate on my white brothers and sisters, but I don't know why y'all act like y'all don't want to be around us because where else you going to get the culture from? I'm just saying. <laughs>
You know where you get, you can't even create a TikTok video without watching the black folk do what they do. I'm just saying, Indiana's on Dana Black. Those are not views of my candidates on the show. Those are Dana Black views. Y'all, every week we are bringing you uh, candidates, both mayors and council people who are running for office. I also have some city clerks that'll be coming on because those races are up as well. There's an opportunity for you to learn about who these candidates are because the bottom line is it doesn't matter how much energy we take to the state house. We can prevent bad legislation from being introduced if we show up in May and November. And if you can, if you don't like the legislation, then you need to find out who is running for office at every level and give them some of your energy and give them some of your time so they can be in position to write good policy instead of bad crap policy that harms people that they don't even know. All right, Indiana Zone, thank y'all for tuning in. I will holler at y'all next week. Peace. Turn Left is the property of Black Pearl IT Solutions. Executive producer, Indiana's own Dana Black. Music by www.binsound.com.